Hi, I'm Dr. Randy Martin. I'm a clinical professor of cardiovascular surgery here at Mount Sinai. I'm thrilled to be joined by my friend and uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Ismail El Hamamzi. Ismail is currently the Randall B. Greep Professor of Cardio Cardiovascular Surgery and the System Director of the Aortic Surgery here at Mount Sinai. Congratulations. Recently, as the president, you were elected by your peers of the Heart Valve Society. That's right. So thanks for joining us. So, Ismail, we're here to talk about the Ross procedure, okay? There's been a tremendous resurgence due to you. So tell me a little bit about the Ross. You know, the Ross actually started before even biological valves were developed. All right. So the, the original paper was published in 1967, over 50 years ago now. And the, the reality at the time, you only had mechanical valves. And so different surgeons were thinking about different ways to address the problem because mechanical valves, as you know, come with a variety of potential right. issues from bleedings and stroke. And, and the idea was, well, the way the heart is built, there are four valves, but two of them look exactly identical, the aortic valve and the pulmonary valve. They sit side by side. A pulmonary valve is a mirror image of a normal aortic valve. Right. It has three leaflets. Even if you're born with a bicuspid aortic valve, your pulmonary valve is, has three leaflets. Right. And it looks exactly like a normal aortic. So the idea was, well, how about we take that pulmonary valve that is one's own valve, right. one's own living valve, put it in the aortic position, and then replace the pulmonary valve with something that is perhaps a little less good, not living, but on the pulmonary side, the pressures are lower, the stresses are lower. It may not be that detrimental to have something that is not your own on the pulmonary side. Right. Whereas the aortic side is really where everything happens in the heart. It's the most important valve in the heart. So you really want to put your best substitute in that position. As you know, Randy, I spent four years in London after I finished my training in no. cardiac surgery in the lab in uh, uh, doing a PhD trying to understand the cellular and the molecular mechanisms behind aortic valve function. And I can tell you one thing because I'll bore everybody here <laughs> to death if I actually went into the detail, but an aortic valve is far more than just something that opens and shuts. It performs so many functions that are critical to for coronary flow, to reduce the workload of the ventricle, which is the pumping chamber right, of the heart, right. um, to reduce the stresses of opening and closing of the leaflets. And that ultimately is what translates into all of these long-term benefits which we're now observing. And fundamentally, that is very different than saying we're going to put an artificial valve that is made or a in a factory a structure, yeah. with a rigid structure, is, whether it's mechanical or a, a cow or a porcine valve, because these are non-living valves. So they perform one aspect of what a normal aortic valve does, which is open-close, but none of the other functions. And that, in the long term, ends up I don't want to say, you know, costing the patient because there's still very valuable sure, sure. options for patients. But when you compare it to the ROS, particularly in that subset of young and middle-aged adults, the results are just not the same. And what we've discovered over the last 10 to 15 years through many studies and many uh, uh, cohorts from all over the world is that there is only one operation that so far has been shown to restore the life expectancy of the patients in the long term versus that of a normal individual in the general population, and that is the ROS. There's only one other operation within our cardiac surgery field that has ever shown that as well, and that is repairing the mitral valve for right. patients with right. mitral valve. So this was a real, in a way, it was a real watershed moment when that first publication came out in 2010, showing that, you know, when you operate on patients and you put a, uh, you do a ROS procedure, we looked at their outcomes at 12 and 13 years, and we realized that their survival curve was exactly identical to the general population, something that had never which been- is, Which is staggering. Staggering, because I mean, it had never been observed with a tissue or a mechanical valve. This is the original study that we published in The Lancet in 2010. 2010. Okay. This is a randomized trial, which means patients were, were randomized to undergo a ROS or a homograft replacement, which right. is similar to a biological right. valve. And what you see here is survival of these patients after 12 years. And you can notice that in green, the patients who had a ROS procedure had survival that is exactly identical to the general population, natural so agent sex. Whereas patients who had a homograft, which is similar to a biological valve, had lower Started than expected off. survival. And that was, like I said, this was a this was a real aha moment that we all paused when we saw that data come out. And again, because these, nobody expected to see this. And, with an and they're being performed by people that do this operation 
a lot. A lot. And and so following that, other groups starting to look at their data, groups who had persevered and right. at a high volume. And from everywhere, the data was exactly the same. Survival was exactly identical to the general population. Okay. And survival was better than that with a tissue or a mechanical valve. In fact, just recently, Randy, we published this the update to that Lancet right. trial. We now have normal survival up to 25 years after, well which into is, the third which decade. Which is amazing to think about an aortic valve survival with an uncomplicated life for 25 years. And with no blood thinners, no, no blood medication, thinners. and no restrictions, a completely normal yeah. activity level, and a normal quality of life. So this was really quite exciting uh, data that we saw and that, that really supports using the ROS. Um, this is results from my first 450 ROS procedures. Right. We presented this at the AATS last year, the 10-year outcomes. And what you see here is the freedom from regurgitation, from leakage across the aortic valve at 10 years. So almost 98% of the patients have perfect valve function at 10 years, which is, Amazing. again, quite remarkable. In addition to that, the freedom from aortic reoperation is 98% of the patients at 10 years. In other words, only 2% of the patients have needed another intervention, a repeat intervention on the aortic valve at 10 years. Now think about it, in young people, if you put a tissue valve at 10 years, you're looking at almost half the patients will have had a repeat intervention. If you put a mechanical valve, the risk is lower, similar to this, but you are exposed to the risk of stroke or bleeding, which is around 10% at right. 10 years. Right. Um, and if you look at the risk of any re-intervention, so whether on the aortic or pulmonary valve, it's around 95% at 10 years, so only 5% of the patients. So we're incredibly excited about this data. Why? Because the, the, what this suggests is that we're on our results, the way we do the ROS today, are an improvement versus what all these previous uh, cohorts had shown. Right. Again, not because we're better, but because we learned from the things that work less well. And it bodes very well for patients well into the second decade that I wouldn't anticipate the need for any re-intervention at 20 years to be far more than 10 to 15%. In other words, over 80% uh, of the patients, if they had surgery today, would still be going strong with their operation 20 years from now. There's nothing in our that's field that's that scary. allows us to say anything like this to patients. You know, the data is very clear about the, the benefits of the ROS right. in the long term. I think now there's very little doubt about the fact that from a survival, from a quality of life standpoint, from a durability standpoint, from a valve performance standpoint, all of these things score better with the ROS if you, know, if you held the score sheet versus a tissue or a mechanical valve. The one caveat, however, is that it has to be performed in high volume centers where there's expertise. And what we have been talking about for the last five to 10 years is that concept of Ross centers reference of centers the, or reference centers, centers of excellence. Center, yeah, absolutely. Very similar to what you've been promoting for many years. Right. Uh, and Dr. Adams here on the mitral, the mitral side, sure. the concept of mitral reference centers. So it doesn't mean that if you're not a reference center, you can't do the operation, but it certainly means that being a reference center, you know, there's a very clear correlation between volumes and outcomes. It means that you have a whole team that is very um, used to treating and managing right. patients who are undergoing right. these operations from anesthesia and nursing, perfusionists, uh, intensivists, all of, it really takes a lot more than just a surgeon who knows how to sew circles. Um, and so that concept of center of excellence is one that, has become really the centerpiece of this Ross Renaissance. So, and there's been a, uh, the, you, you mentioned the resurgence, but the numbers, and you all, you know, you've personally done 750, 800 yeah, cases. Yeah, somewhere there. Uh, uh, this is the, the, the growth of our Ross program from when we started. and Here uh, at Mount Sinai. Well, I was, you know, I was, I was in Canada in before Canada I joined. So the yellow started. line is when I joined Mount Sinai. And the reason why the volumes are dropped so much in 2020, we got hit with COVID yeah. <laughs> and we're restarting our ROS volumes. But just last year, we did over 100 ROS procedures, which, which we're very proud of because it's the first time over 100 ROSs were done in any um, center. And, and the, uh, but more importantly, what we're proud of is the safety record in that whole 
um, experience the two dots you see here are the two mortalities we've had in that series. So from a safety standpoint, it compares very favorably to a regular aortic valve replacement. Right. The risk is less than 0.5%. Um, but having volumes like these, what it translates into, or what it reflects, first of all, is ha that it's it's much more than a single person doing this. It's a whole team. I, I think the concept of having a center that has dedicated itself to having specialized, you know, people are committed to doing this type of surgery and doing it well makes a tremendous difference. It's a constellation of professionals that are all here around the patient and the patient getting that ROS procedure and to optimize the safety of the operation, the durability of the operation. So it takes surgeons, a team of surgeons, not an individual surgeon. Sure. Um, it takes um, intensivists, anesthesiologists, perfusionists, nurses, imaging, cardiologists. There are so many people involved in what we call or define as a reference center. Right. Um, and ultimately, I think that's a really important thing. Yeah, and you know, you've also learned uh, not only the technical expertise and the things uh, out of the care for the patients, but new new concepts of medical treatment early on. I mean, how do you, how do you treat blood pressure and uh, anti-inflammatory agents and things like that? So there's been a, a you know, the experience, it brings learning, and it, that all is aimed toward the durability of the long-term outcome. 100%. I always say, you know, today we're not smarter than, our, than the pioneers who started all this stuff, but we have the benefit of hindsight. And what that allows us to do is to learn from the things that worked, but also learn from the things that did not work and try to improve on those. And so, you know, the ROS that we're doing today, which I call the ROS 2.0, is, is based on what we now know are the long-term benefits in terms of survival and quality of life. Right. And what we've worked on, for, you know, what I've dedicated really my, my, my career now for the last 15, 20 years to is trying to improve on the durability of the operation, further improve on the durability of the operation. And, and, and that, is, that is a combination of technical modifications to the mm -hmm. operation, mm -hmm. but also, like you said, of medical management after the operation. So our job is not done the minute the patient leaves right. the hospital. That's where the work starts. And the patient is a real partner in what we do. Um, the, and as you said, one of the cornerstones is controlling blood pressure to allow this pulmonary valve to adapt to its new environment, right. because that is what guarantees that in the long term, um, the results can be very good. But these, but the, and I, I didn't mean to imply that the patients are going to be on a strict medical regime for the rest of their life. Yeah, the whole idea behind this is really to allow patients to have a completely normal life. You know, the goals of surgery when we replace an aortic valve in an elderly patient, let's say someone in their 70s or 80s, is really symptom relief. That's our primary focus is how can we make that patient feel better and then live, you know, the 15, 20 or 25 years they have ahead of them. When we're operating on someone in their 20s, 30s, 40s, or 50s, the goal is a little bit different. Of course, symptoms, if there are any symptoms, right. you know, we want to relieve them. In the majority of patients, they have no symptoms because they're still young and they have so much physiological reserve. And so our primary goal is to make sure that these patients will live up to blow out their 85th birthday candles. We, we want everyone to have a normal life expectancy. In addition to that, we want them to have a perfectly normal quality of life. We want these people to enjoy being parents, to enjoy sports, traveling, whatever their hobbies may be, right. whether it's skiing, biking, uh, uh, um, jumping off an, uh, an airplane with a parachute, <laughs> anything, whatever it is, we want them to be able to do it without any limitations. We want them to be normal parents playing with their kids. We want them to have normal professional ambitions. Ultimately, when you see, you know, when you get these messages from young people that you've treated doing Ross and you see them doing all kinds of uh, crazy things or things they never or thought having, they were, they children, wouldn't be able to do, or children. those that had children. Right. You know, nothing is more gratifying than That's that. That's fabulous. Well, yeah. so thank you for, for sharing that with us. Uh, I've learned a lot, as, as I always do. I hope that you've enjoyed this, too. We, we, I think we've all learned a lot, and there's tremendous wisdom in everything Ismail has said. So thanks for joining us, and we'll see you soon.